Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Daniel Smith, the director of the Foreign Service Institute, which is the chief learning organization for the Department of State. We are happy to be part of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative and to continue to tell the stories of these truly remarkable and yet not necessarily widely known heroes from our past and present, even in these current circumstances today. Today's honoree was a remarkable trailblazer and leader throughout her nearly 30-year career with the U.S. Department of State. We originally launched the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative in the fall of 2019, but this is our first entirely virtual event as part of this series. We'd be focused today on the contributions of Patricia Morton, better known by her nickname Pistol Pack and Patty, which she earned for her excellent aim as a diplomatic security special agent. I would like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative, which highlights the stories of modern day heroes among us alongside heroes from the department's rich history. These heroes have displayed sound policy judgment as well as intellectual, moral, and physical courage while elevating American diplomacy. Thank you to Ambassador Lino Gutierrez and to all the Cox trustees who have joined us for today's event. I'd also like to thank the National Museum of American Diplomacy for generously sharing artifacts and photos from their collection that Patty donated upon her retirement from the department. Their expertise was critical in putting together today's fascinating program. Let me welcome today's speakers and colleagues. Deputy Assistant Secretary for Diplomatic Security Training, Wendy Bashman, National Museum of uh, Diplomacy Associate Curator, Catherine Speckert, who will share stories and artifacts highlighting Patty's extraordinary career, and Deputy, Deputy, excuse me, Diplomatic Security Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Julie Cabus, who will speak about working today as a special agent. Soon you will see how all of our speakers are connected to Patty's rich legacy. I'd also like to remind our viewers that we will leave 15 minutes at the end of the program for question and answers. So please submit your questions via the YouTube chat box. Patty embodied all of the US, heroes of US diplomacy qualities that we're looking for. She showed us how, what we can all achieve with our intellectual, moral, and physical courage in service to the mission of advancing the interests of the American people and their safety. Throughout her career, Patty placed a priority on training and educating others on how to protect themselves and what resources they could draw upon. She made historic contributions to the department's approach to emergency preparedness, launched the department's first personal security trainings, and was one of the early advocates for diversity recruitment and hiring. For these reasons, we are honoring her today as a hero of U.S. diplomacy. Patty's career with the State Department began in 1965 when she joined as a foreign officer staff secretary and served in four diplomatic missions in Asia and Africa. In 1972, after being recruited by the predecessor of today's Diplomatic Security Service, Patty became the first female Diplomatic Security Special Agent. While being the first in a role comes with a unique set of challenges, Patty faced them all with grace, focus, and commitment. She soon went on to become a regional security officer in Vietnam during the war and departed to Saigon just before the fall of that city. Following her assignment in Saigon, Patty went on to be the regional security officer in The Hague and then returned stateside to Washington, DC, where she spent the remaining years of her career. During this period, Patty was one of the early advocates for diversity recruitment and hiring at the State Department and went on to be the deputy director of the Equal Employment Opportunity and Civil Rights Office. She also became a member of the department's board of examiners where she was responsible for the selection of new entrants to the foreign service. Patty remained engaged in inspiring the next generation to consider a career with the state department, even returning to speak to her alma mater in Washington state about her service with the department. Patty retired from the state department in 1994, but she remained committed and a champion of US diplomacy throughout the course of her life. From start to finish, she left a rich legacy, leading by example and doing her best in any circumstance. And now I'd like to welcome my colleague, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Diplomatic Security Training, Wendy Bashton, who will speak about Patty's work in diplomatic security. Thank you for joining us, Wendy. Thank you, Dan. I know I speak for all DS special agents in expressing our appreciation to the Foreign Service Institute 
the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Steering Committee, the Cox Foundation, and the National Museum of American Diplomacy for organizing this Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy event featuring our first female special agent, Patty Morton. Patty was a trailblazer. In 1972, she joined what was then called the State Department's Office of Security, the precursor of today's Bureau of Diplomatic Security as a special agent. Uh, the hiring process wasn't easy. Uh, Patty later learned that all the women who had previously applied had been turned down. But why Patty and why then? Well, the women's movement had made big strides uh, to get women into jobs that had traditionally gone to men only. That fact and the addition of federal legislation gave Patty the opportunity that her predecessor applicants hadn't had, but it wasn't easy. Patty was assigned to a desk, but without any training. Patty's job required her to walk the streets of the District of Columbia in dangerous neighborhoods while conducting criminal investigations. Yet local laws didn't permit women to carry firearms and guns. While working in the Washington field office, Patty took unarmed self-defense training through the DC Metropolitan Police Academy. After completing her training, she arranged for similar training at the State Department for others during their lunch hours. Our nonviolent self-defense training today through the Foreign Service Institute and Diplomatic Security exists thanks in part to the precedent-setting efforts of Patty Morton. She drew the department's attention to the need and the utility of education around personal safety and preparedness from members of our foreign affairs community. Shortly after Patty joined the department's Office of Security, the district finally passed legislation that permitted women to carry weapons, and Patty developed excellence marksmanship. Those were the same skills she later de demonstrated during her tour in Vietnam, when even the Marine security guards who were charged with guarding the embassy were impressed with her ability to handle weapons and thus nicknamed her Pistol Packin' Patty. Today, training is an integral part of life as a diplomatic security special agent for both women and men. Gender is no longer an issue in the types of training our special agents receive. I'm honored to serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Security Training uh, for our staff, not only DS, but for those State Department personnel who are assigned to post overseas. Just last November, we officially opened our new Foreign Affairs Security Training Center, or FASC, in Blackstone, Virginia. FASI is one of the largest federal security and counter threat training facilities in the United States and honestly, probably the world. I know Patty would have been proud to see how security training has evolved throughout the State Department. But back in 1972, Patty's trailblazing had just started. When she first came on board, all special agents were expected to serve on protective security details, yet only men were selected. Through a fluke, as she called it, Patty was, Patty was inadvertently assigned to the team uh, of the Secretaries of State's uh, protective detail. After a lengthy discussion, the team leader assigned her to watch the ladies' room, since the Secretary's wife was gonna be accompanying her husband. And that's what Patty did. Not only that night, but for many protective details after that. Patty often explained it was her job to do her assignment no matter what and to the best of her ability. Uh, about a year later, her assignments uh, improved because uh, of the support from then Special Agent John Ford, who was very supportive of her career. Patty began doing assignments, performing the same functions as her male counterparts, including covering the Chinese acrobatic team that came to Boston after President Nixon reestablished the relationship between the U.S. and China. Today, thanks in part to Patty's intellectual and physical courage, female special agents and their male counterparts 
equally serve on protective details throughout the world. Female special agents protect the Secretary of State, as well as visiting foreign dignitaries below the head of state level. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, U.S. delegations overseas, and even U.S. athletes at international events. Throughout her career, Patty continued to display leadership in her assignments overseas. During her service in Vietnam, she became the first woman regional security officer, a position that manages the security for the entire embassy. Patty's dedication to ensuring that the whole embassy community was briefed and trained for emergencies is an early exemplar that we've been able to build upon. Now, female special agents have seen great success as regional security officers and related positions in the 275 U.S. diplomatic posts throughout the world. RSOs, as we call them, manage security programs and provide the first line of defense for U.S. personnel and their families. And they oversee the protection of diplomatic facilities and national security information. Last year, I had the honor of representing DS leadership at Patty's Memorial Service in Napa Vine, Washington. And we celebrated her life in DS, as well as all the other accomplishments and volunteerism that she did in her retirement. In closing, Patty Morton did make it easier for those of us who have followed in her footsteps. I'm proud to represent all the women in state and that we are honoring Patty today. I know, and now, I would like to turn it over to the National Museum of American Diplomacy Associate Curator, Catherine Speckart, who will discuss Patty Morton's nearly 30-year career at the State Department and her contributions as a hero of U.S. diplomacy and illuminate her life through the many artifacts that Patty donated to the museum. Catherine? It's over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, both Ambassador Smith and Das Bashan, that was such a wonderful um, tribute to Patty and you can hopefully already see why she is a hero of diplomacy. Um, and I am honored today to be part of this celebration of Patty Morton. Um, she was a big supporter of the National Museum of American Diplomacy, um, as well as other cultural programs at the Department of State. Um, I had the distinct pleasure um, of meeting with her several times over the years, and I knew her as a kind and resilient and purposeful person. Um, and the museum now has many artifacts representing her career. Um, in fact, I think that she is the most, one of the most, if not the most well-documented diplomats in the museum's collection. And she accomplished that status, you know, due to her own sense of history and legacy, she, you know, methodically throughout her career, she saved items and that documented her contributions. Um, and that, to me, as a curator, that is the great thing about um, collecting diplomacy and creating a museum about diplomacy because what might seem like a real ordinary mundane artifact really can be something extraordinary and shed light on U.S. diplomatic history and diplomatic relations. Um, so we'll take a look at some of these items today um, and I would like to note that um, every um, photo and every artifact that you'll see is part of um, the uh, National Museum of American Diplomacy's collection, thanks to Patty. Um, so yes, as, as she was um, introduced, let me advance my slide here. Um, so she, um, here we see Patty in her first assignment in Kathmandu, Nepal. So at age 28, after already traveling around the world as a tourist, she inquired at the State Department for an overseas job. And she was accepted into the Foreign Service um, as a secretary in August of 1965. Um, and she was assigned to Nepal. Nepal suited her very well because she was a lover of mountain climbing um, after growing up near Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Um, and as you can see, she's there in her convertible, which she agreed to Nepal only if they would ship her beloved convertible over there as well. Um, and one thing you can probably also notice is that these are all very posed uh, photographs. Um, Patty was 
um, she was noticed early on as, you know, not only is she photogenic, but she's also was noticed early on as the type of person and the type of character that the department wanted to recruit. And so from the get go, she was included in re recruiting materials. And you can see this um, Foreign Service Secretary's recruiting pamphlet. Um, and she's in the, the upper corner there on the phone. And you can tell it's very much geared, obviously, to a, a female uh, pool of applicants. Um, and the, the pamphlet emphasizes the allure of a worldwide assignment and the chance to travel the globe while working for the department, um, as well as the opportunity to gain a wide variety of experiences, unlike perhaps your typical uh, secretarial job uh, based in the United States. Um, and here you see her again in Nepal, um, on the sit seated on the right, discussing matters with her colleagues there, looking at the map of Nepal. She's a, a very, very photogenic young woman, um, very much, you can tell, enjoying uh, living and working abroad um, as a Foreign Service officer. Um, and after Nepal, uh, she went to Kinshasa, then uh, in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and so in addition to her regular secretarial duties, you can see her seated there um, at her desk in Kinshasa. She served as the deputy um, post security officer and actually received a meritorious step increase for her outstanding work uh, in conducting security related investigations uh, with those duties. Um, on the right of this screen is actually Cameroon. Um, she took a temporary duty assignment to Yaoundé in 1969. Um, and one thing we realized about Patty is that she was an avid photographer and videographer. She left behind albums worth of photos and hours and hours of home movies. She loved to document her surroundings and the people and her travels. And these photos are great because I think they really offer us um, a glimpse into what it was like to serve in a place like Cameroon in, in the late 1960s. Um, the lower picture of those goats are actually right outside the front door of the embassy. Um, and then the upper photo is the view outside her apartment. And she noted on the reverse of that photo that she loved um, gazing out at the mountain peaks um, in the distance there. Um, so after Cameroon, she went on to serve in Singapore. So we see here, she's in Singapore from 1970 to 1972. Um, she was served as both the secretary um, in Singapore as well as the embassy's protocol officer. And so in the top, you can see her receiving an award for her work. And in the lower photo shows her at uh, the annual Marine Corps Ball, always a big event at, at embassies. Um, and so her good work, and, and she's obviously getting, you know, honored for all of her good works, and this was getting her noticed. And I, you know, and I'm sure all the recruitment publicity helped as well. Um, so while she was in Singapore, um, just out of the blue, she received a letter uh, from the Office of Security, um, which was noted as the precursor to today's diplomatic security. Um, and they were asking her to stop by next time she was in Washington. Well, you can imagine what stopping by means and um, that her stopping by led to several interviews with a range of people asking her questions like, you know, how would she feel about carrying a weapon? Um, and that line of questioning, of course, led her to her trailblazing job with the Office of Security, um, as uh, Ambassador Smith and Das Bashanin mentioned. Um, and as they also mentioned, um, so the late 60s, early 70s, you know, this was a time when the country was starting to implement these legislative reforms aimed at fairer treatment for minorities and women. Um, and this, of course, included employment opportunities. So there was the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, strengthened by subsequent executive orders, as well as the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972. And uh, all of this had the effect of prohibiting discrimination uh, in the workplace based on race, color, national origin, sex, or religion. And so an executive order uh, that came out in 1967 established the Federal Women's Program. Uh, with a coordinator designated at each federal agency. And it was through this program that each agency was directed to identify positions um, and offices for which women may be underrepresented or not represented at all. So at the Department of State uh, in the early 1970s, uh, officials uh, 
pinpointed the Office of Security as well as the courier service as two areas that at the time did not employ any women. So this was the, the milieu that, that Patty was, was entering when she was called in, you know, to stop by and, uh, and come for an interview. Um, and so then she was appointed, of course, as the first female security agent. And she was posted in the Washington field office as an investigator. And her appointment was announced in the department's newsletter of um, May of 1972. And it stated somewhat nonchalantly, it says, chalk up another breakthrough for women in the department. The Foreign Service now has its first female security officer. Um, and then the article continues and it, it mentions the path which lay ahead for her. Uh, the article states, after receiving training and gaining experience as an investigator, Miss Morton will be given an assignment overseas as a regional security officer. You know, and it's interesting that training was mentioned as Das Fashion mentioned, um, she really kind of had to make it up on her own. She didn't at the time receive much training. Um, and it was a difficult transition for Patty being as anyone can imagine being the first female in a in a completely male dominated field. field. Um, and ironically, she also lacked support from the female secretarial staff. Um, they would not help her with administrative duties. She had to type all of her documents, memos, um, and even documents and things that were like 100 pages long. Um, they would not do it for her. Um, and another interesting challenge um, was that at the time, the Office of Security did not um, issue um, gun holsters that could practically be worn by a woman. Um, and so Patty being who she is, she found her own solution to this and she um, would carry her Office of Security issued revolver by using this dark blue clutch that you see here on the screen. Um, Patty was, as you can imagine, Patty was sure to point out that it was very tricky to quickly draw her pistol out of a clutch when the need arose. Um, and you can also see here this great photo, I love this photo, um, of her holding the clutch at a reception. And it leaves us to wonder, you know, is, <laughs> does she have her revolver with her at, at that moment? Um, and so her, her can do, you know, get the job done, don't complain spirit was really emblematic of her character, really enabling her to be an effective trailblazer for women. Um, and as was mentioned, and as the article noted, um, in March 1974, she then went on to be assigned as the first female regional security officer, and she was posted in war-torn um, Vietnam. She was one of four RSOs in Vietnam, and within three months, she had become the assistant supervisory uh, RSO. And so her duties included supervising the daily activities of the Marine Security Guard Detachment at the embassy. Um, as well as things like attending meetings with senior military officials. Um, and she also served as a liaison officer with the US Information Service as well as uh, USAID, um, the development agency. Um, and so on this screen here, we see um, items that any diplomat serving in Saigon at that time would have received. The map um, pin pinpoints uh, US government offices uh, throughout the city. And the ID card in the, in the lower right corner is her diplomatic ID, which was uh, issued by the Vietnamese government. And diplomats all over the world in, in many countries receive this type of diplomatic ID and it, it vouches for her position with the US government. Um, and in the upper corner, the movement order I found really interesting. Um, inside it has written instructions, which allowed Patty to travel within, within Saigon for a specific purpose. And so during the final days of the war, there was a curfew uh, imposed in the city. And so a movement order could be issued um, by the embassy to allow um, diplomats to travel uh, during those curfew hours. Um, and so one of the major areas where it was assumed that women in security would have a problem was with handling the Marine security guards. Um, but Patty proved her naysayers wrong, and she created an excellent rapport with the large Marine security guard uh, contingent at the embassy. 
And she knew how to gain their respect. She gained their respect and forged common ground through her excellent marksmanship abilities, as Dash Fashion mentioned. Um, in her oral history, Patty stated, I was able to hit things even with the bazookas and the larger weapons that they had not been able to zero in on in the various times they had gone out shooting. Um, in fact, as a sign of the, the security guard, the, the Marines' respect for her, they gave her this camouflage uniform that you see here, complete with a matching hairband. I love that. Um, so she's got her, her camo and her hairband uh, that she was able to wear um, to the shooting range. They, they wanted her to fit in. She, she, was, part, she was part of them uh, now by, by giving her this camouflage uniform. And here we see another great photo of Patty um, sporting, that, sporting that uniform. Um, so while in Vietnam, um, one very significant thing that Patty accomplished was that she and her colleagues rewrote and upgraded the post's evacuation plan, um, which was obviously very significant, um, as we know, and is, it was put to use when Saigon finally fell to the North Vietnamese in late April 1975, um, which required the complete evacuation and closure of the embassy. Um, against her wishes, she was ordered to evacuate Saigon a few weeks before the city fell. Her supervisor, her male supervisor, felt that the environment was no place for a woman. Um, she had to leave without any of her household effects and nothing was returned to her. Um, and initially she refused to leave her post. Um, the medical officer at the embassy, however, was ordered, to, was told that he needed to order her to leave. And so Patty requested a doctor's appointment at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines where, where she would go from Saigon first to the Philippines. And she wanted that doctor's appointment to accompany the medical order of leave. Um, and so as you can see on this slide, um, she explains why she did that. She says, I had the physical examination because I did not want women to forever after have to carry the burden of people saying, see, women can't stand up to an emergency crisis situation. I passed the physical with flying colors. And so this was just characteristic of Patty. She was very aware of her position as a first and she wanted to clear the path for any woman coming behind her. Um, and you see here also her um, diplomatic passport. Um, and the lower stamp um, is from US immigration and it's dated April 24th, 1975. So she was far away from Saigon uh, when the final embassy evacuation and closure uh, took place on April 30th, a few days later. Um, so as was noted after Vietnam, she was assigned as an RSO in the Netherlands, uh, certainly um, much quieter <laughs> than, uh, than Saigon at the time. Um, she continued in a similar role as RSO as before. She would advise the ambassador and other officials and embassy personnel concerning security issues. She participated in country team meetings um, and she supervised the U.S. and the local guard forces. Um, here you see Patty, she's actually in Paris at the moment um, at a regional RSO conference. Um, and then the document that you see in the lower corner is her Dutch driver's license, uh, which is a pretty cool document. I think that's neat. Um, so after, after the Hague, Patty uh, went back to Washington DC, which became her home base for the rest of her career. Um, except she did do a few temporary duties um, in various parts of the world, but she was largely based in Washington, DC. And she uh, returned to the Office of Security. Uh, she was a regional operations officer for Europe and Africa, and she served on various task forces as well. She also continued to do protective details. And one of her all-time favorite protective details came in March of 1977, when she had the opportunity to protect um, the Princess of Monaco, the famous Grace Kelly. Uh, Princess Grace was visiting New York um, for various events, including a party for the Russian cellist and conductor Mstislav Rostropovich, and I apologize for probably not pronouncing his, his name correctly, um, but Rostropovich, um, after he had made his conducting debut at New York's Carnegie, uh, New York's Carnegie Hall. Um, so at the time, this is an interesting story that Patty told us, 
At the time, um, if a protective detail required an attendance at a formal event, a male officer could request reimbursement for the cost of his tuxedo rental. Female officers <clears throat> could not be reimbursed because there were no options for dress rentals at the time. Women officers had to buy with their own funds a formal dress to attend, uh, to be a part of this protective detail for a formal event. So Patty did just that. Um, she uh, said that she even asked Princess Grace some advice on what to buy and what to wear um, for these events during her New York visit. And so these are the, the two dresses that she bought, those two beautiful dresses. Um, and Patty built a relationship of trust with Princess Grace during her, their time together. Um, Patty shared some of her personal history, you know, that she was the first female diplomatic security agent and all the various hurdles that she had to overcome in this role. Um, and to, at the end of the visit, Princess Grace gave Patty this small blue uh, clutch uh, that you see here on the slide, as well as the signed photo of her um, as a token of appreciation for all of her work. And, you know, what a more perfect gift uh, to give Patty as it, you know, honors her place in history and really shows how she carried out her duties, even when all of the necessary tools and assistance were not made available to her. Um, so here we see in 1981, uh, Patty joined the Office of uh, Equal Opportunity and uh, Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights as the Deputy Director. Um, in this important role, she also served simultaneously as the Federal Women's Program Manager, uh, where she directed the department's efforts to provide employment for women at all levels, which is, you know, a wonderful, perfect role for her. Um, you know, and as demonstrated in previous roles, she put a priority on training and educating others on how to protect themselves and what resources they could draw upon. Um, as the women's program manager, she produced this lengthy and thorough packet, you see here on, on the left-hand side, um, about sexual harassment, um, what it is, how to prevent it, and how to report it in the workplace. And um, so yeah, the, the packet is there on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and talking about training, you know, she, we've emphasized that she really had a special interest and, and skill in training others um, and, you know, raising the standards in her profession as she did. And as the women's program manager, Patty organized educational events um, that featured uh, speakers on women's issues, as well as practical seminars with the DC, poli the DC police on rape prevention. Um, and she was also innovative in her approach to training using objects um, as, as teaching aids, as, as we can see here. She taught defensive driving for embassy employees and family members using these uh, little toy cars to help emphasize the techniques and, and really help people visualize uh, what they needed to do. She also illustrated security threats faced by diplomats. She would carry around this, this section of a, a consulate window with a bullet embedded in it. So, you know, the, really emphasize the real dangers uh, that, that our diplomats face abroad. Um, and then in, in Vietnam, she was assigned to physically survey all of the consulates situated throughout Vietnam. And she used these two photos that you see at the bottom. They're both showing different sides of the embassy compound. Um, the exterior walls or fencing to show secure and less secure types of barriers. She was very concerned about that fence. Um, and the notations on the reverse of these photos uh, indicate, indicate kind of her talking points, how she would use those in training. Um, here we see Patty, um, 1983, she became a member of the State Department's Board of Examiners, where she was responsible for the selection of candidates for the Foreign Service. Um, the goal of that selection process is to give candidates, regardless of socioeconomic background, education, or expertise, a chance to demonstrate their potential to be a Foreign Service officer. And so in this role, um, Patty applied her long and varied um, experiences in the Foreign Service and her clout as a trailblazer to advocate for women. And as was noted, building a more diverse diplomatic workforce. So this photo actually shows her with members of the State Department's Women's Action Organization, not the Board of Examiners. But I include that here because it, her involvement in this group um, is emblematic of 
the ethos that she brought to all of her positions during her career. She was always mindful of creating um, opportunities for women in the department. Um, in the latter years of her career, um, she continued to serve as a diplomatic security officer, um, applying her extensive knowledge and skills honed throughout her various roles. Um, she was an interagency coordinator, a regional operations officer, a RSO program representative, um, where she ensured compliance and consistency with Department of State uh, rules, policies, and regulations. Um, Patty retired from the Foreign Service in 19, uh, September of 1994, receiving several awards and honors. Um, and true to her world traveler spirit, she immediately um, applied to be part of the Foreign Affairs Reserve Corps, which at the time was a mechanism for the department to draw upon the talent of retirees um, as needed for short-term assignments uh, around the world. Um, and um, so she, she, she never had to uh, actually, you know, be called up for that, but the fact that she made herself av uh, immediately available um, shows her dedication to the mission um, and the cause. Um, I did want to include this, <laughs> this artifact because it's just fantastic. You know, as was noted, she, she won the nickname Pistol Pack and Patty. Uh, which stuck with her throughout throughout her career, um, and here you can see um, you know one of her target practices and in a posed shot there with her pistol. Um, an advertisement in the 1970s, um, I think, really captures Patty's place of honor as a trailblazer. It says um, she Patty has climbed Mount Cameroon, Mount Kinabalu, and other peaks and scaled State Department heights never before achieved by a woman. Um, and she certainly overcame many hurdles in her career. Um, she really was a model of resilience, um, confidence, uh, dedicated service to others and especially women um, and help them find it within themselves to do the same for others. Um, Patty stated in her oral history, uh, what I hope is that the problems that I and the other women experienced who came early into the Office of Security, that we fought battles which new agents will not have to fight. Um, and I wanted to end the slides with this one. Um, here she is um, in the diplomatic reception rooms at the Department of State. She was a big supporter of the, re the, the diplomatic reception rooms as well. Um, and in retirement, Patty donated her time and her resources to many charitable causes. Um, she remained a petite and plucky woman, as a, as a newspaper article once dubbed her. Um, I, on a personal note, I remember seeing Patty, you know, wa walking the department halls, usually to the bunch library or, you know, down the sidewalk in Foggy Bottom. And she was always pleased to stop and say hello and, and ask how the museum project was coming along. And when I would see her from afar, I imagined, you know, what all the passersby would think if they knew they had just crossed paths with a woman who, as a DS agent, could pick them up and throw them over her shoulder using those skills honed in those unarmed defense classes that Dash Bashman mentioned. Or, you know, if they knew that this woman was a better shot than most men. Um, Patty bore the burden of being a first with grace and humility. Um, her experiences truly paved the way for not only other women in security, but I think all women in the department. Um, and I just wanted to note that in this photo, she is um, pictured here with a print of uh, Ruth Brian Owen, another first. Ruth Brian Owen was the first female uh, chief of mission, U.S. chief of mission. She was uh, President Ro Roosevelt's uh, envoy to Denmark in 1933. So we've got our We've got two firsts standing there together. Um, so it has been an honor to share all these fantastic artifacts and, and photos with you. I'm gonna welcome um, Julie Cabus, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in, the, in Diplomatic Security to join me now, if Julie wants to come on. Hi, good afternoon. Hi there. Thanks everybody for your kind words and remarks and especially to um, Ambassador Smith and Das, das Bashanen. Um, I am currently an active duty special agent with diplomatic security, um, and I would just like to comment that 
if it weren't for people like Patty, I certainly wouldn't be here today uh, serving in the capacity in which I do serve. I've been very fortunate in my career with um, diplomatic security that spans over 21 years in, in places, many places that Patty may, had served as well, Kinshasa being among them, and of course, Washington, DC. Most recently, I was the senior regional security officer for United States mission to Iraq, finishing up there uh, in July of last year. Interestingly enough, comments about Patty and equipment and things um, actually resonate very much with me when I uh, took over the Office of Defensive Equipment and Armored Vehicles back in 2011. Um, we yet at that time were still not making female body, um, female cut body for female bodies, uh, body armor, pardon me, that was a mouthful. Um, and as a result, that was an initiative of mine to make sure that our female agents could get the proper amount of protection that they needed uh, with differing body types. So I, I do, I, I have a kindred spirit with Patty in that regard. Um, she, she was absolutely remarkable. Um, notably for me is her willingness to take on roles and responsibilities um, in finding a way to make them work. Uh, what struck me, particularly in my experience in Iraq and in listening to Patty's experience in Vietnam, was her commitment to emergency preparedness and in personal security and safety too. At the end of the day, I think every diplomatic security special agent and every regional security officer just wants their their constituents, their embassy colleagues, their friends to be safe and to enjoy their tours overseas. And one thing Patty invested in greatly that, and, and, and I absolutely believe is where we are valuable assets to the overall foreign service is making sure that posts were ready for conflict. And moreover, while I know for Patty, it was regrettable that she couldn't be in Vietnam at the time when she felt they needed her the most. The fact is that her emergency plan stood the time, stood the test of time, even when she wasn't there. So clearly she had done her job and she did her job very, very well. One thing I would note too about Patty is that, um, you know, listening to her life story makes me very, very proud that I've chosen to be in an organization that's pioneering in many aspects. Diplomatic security, for example, is the first bureau within the Department of State that um, created a diversity and inclusion council. And I think, you know, if you look back over our history, Patty was the beginning of that council many, many, many years ago that DS has, has codified and solidified in this generation of, of serving the department and, and our agent cadre. You know, and, and the nickname Pistol Pack and uh, Patty is, uh, is synonymous with her legacy. But I also would just like to say, I think every single uh, diplomatic security agent that I've ever met and ever worked with has been committed to um, building trust with, with their colleagues. And I, and I would just say too, for Patty, along the lines of uh, personal preparedness, personal safety, and the safety of her, her constituents and her embassies around the world, Learning to shoot wasn't so much about bragging rights, it was it more about um, her colleagues having confidence that she would be there in their, in their time of need. And that, and that resonates with me even today as I um, you know, look towards the latter part of my career with DS, having that, uh, that relationship with your, with your community is really, really important. And through that relationship, you build community as well. Again, I think long before terms like emotional intelligence and community building were, were, were uh, terms that we throw around quite regularly nowadays, I think long before we ever arrived at that, that point in time, Patty was probably a master at both, um, having had built a lot of trust and confidence um, throughout her career with her colleagues, particularly as she paved the way for folks like me and for Das uh, Bashanan. I only have a very short period of time and in these types of events, um, I feel very strongly that the value is in the question and answer period. So I do encourage all of you who are watching this and have the opportunity to do so to put forward your questions. You have a wealth of knowledge on this panel and it would be great to take advantage of some of their experiences to, to, uh, to answer those questions. As I talked about my 21 year career in DS has been phenomenal and I have served in some remarkable places around the world. And I would say that it's it, because of Patty, those opportunities were perhaps stronger or greater as a result. Um, but I do think that in the end, whenever you're the first to do something, you are absolutely the one who sets the bar and you can only grow from, from those scenarios. I know if it wasn't for folks like Patty, I wouldn't absolutely have had the experience to serve in Iraq, for example. And while it was hard and it was difficult, Hearing her story, that was hard and that was difficult. Uh, so I, I do appreciate everyone's time. 
Um, again, the value is in the questions. And so I would like to turn it back over to the moderators to allow for them to, uh, for, for this panel to start fielding some questions. Thank you for all of you that are, are participating and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Okay, I think we can all come back on screen now. Um, fantastic. So um, let's, I'm gonna start with a question either for Wendy or Julie, uh, one or both of you can answer this. Um, what are some um, actions that the State Department and diplomatic security are doing to recruit and retain women uh, in the DS uh, special agent ranks today? So I'll defer to either Wendy or Julie, who'd like to start? I think we both can do this one. Um, let me say as, as a bureau uh, and as a federal law enforcement organization, uh, we struggle as many other federal law enforcement agencies to encourage women to apply. Um, the overseas, living in the foreign affairs community overseas and having to move your family is a challenge. But I think what, what DS is doing uh, to try to tackle that is to show the, the benefits, show the uh, kind of the uniqueness of diplomatic security to potential candidates and, and also target, uh, targeting communities of effort that, that feel the same way that I do and that Julie does about serving our country, uh, living overseas, experiencing other cultures, and so if we find those communities that, that share those same values, then we can try to target potential candidates for that. Um, we still have a lot to do to overcome this or, or to improve this, uh, but I think there's definitely an appetite and a desire within our organization to increase uh, the hiring of women as well as other minorities uh, so that we better represent the American community as a whole. Julie, you want to add anything? Yeah, and I would just add too that, you know, this is an adventure. It's a career as much as it is a lifestyle. And so I, I, I think there's something to be said for coming into the foreign service with eyes wide open because your opportunities are endless. They are what you make of them. And I could not imagine under any circumstance a different adulthood that I've had than what I've had because I think you you really come into this with the idea of I get paid to do this <laughs> you mean I get to travel around the world and meet really interesting people and have experiences that are just to, to most unbelievable and you and I've never stopped appreciating that and I think part of our examination process and our ability to um, recruit people has to tap into that sense of adventure. Like, yes, you are going to be asked to do an awful lot and sometimes it will be difficult. But on the other hand, the stuff you get to do is amazing. Yes, and I think that's what attracted Patty, you know, the adventure that you are going to be going around the world and you never know what, you know, your next job is going to be like. Um, those, are, those are great answers. Um, I'm going to go to uh, an additional one. It says here, um, do we have evidence of Patty's pay as compared to her male colleagues throughout her career? Um, the museum does not. I, I imagine that that is something that could be researched, um, but I, you know, I am, I am not aware of uh, the pay differences that, that she experienced uh, throughout her career. Um, and the, the next question I, I might actually uh, throw back to you all. Um, with the thought first. So the question is, what were some of the particular security issues in Kinshasa? And I assume the questioner means in 1969. Um, you know, those goats, you never know. <laughs> those, those goats could storm the embassy. Um, but I think it, whether it's 1969 or 2020, even a post that seems really sleepy and quiet, there is there are security threats always. Um, and so I would, uh, Again, defer back to Wendy and Julie if you want to, to talk about the readiness, even at a seemingly easy, you know, quiet post. So I served in Kinshasa in um, 2001, uh, 2000 to 2001, I should say. 
I saw the picture of Patty sitting in the in the embassy there, and I think we had the same windows and 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 grills on the windows at the same <laughs> from you know how many thousands of years later, right? <clears throat> While I was there, President Laurent Kabila was assassinated by one of his own bodyguards. And as you can imagine, this occurred at a time when the Marine Detachment commander was out of the country, the senior regional security officer was out of the country. And so the whole security apparatus for the embassy was left in the hands of two people whose collective age didn't reach 50. So my very uh, well-seasoned senior ambassador was Bill Swing and his very astute DCM were phenomenal. And they put an awful lot of trust and faith in both myself and this young uh, Sergeant Deck Commander. And we saw the embassy through that crisis. Part of it though was, and I think about Patty in this instance, part of it was I had had the language, I knew the culture, I had the connections. So I built that community. I was able to get out there and do the, th the things that were necessary. And while there's a modern twist to security concerns through technology and an evolution of perhaps uh, some tactics and training of, of the bad guys, as it were, I think some of the issues remain the same. It's the instability piece of the political apparatus. It's a lack of resources to some degree. And you work together as a community, as an embassy, to overcome all those so that you can work towards a better um, security environment. But I just, I seen that picture of Patty made me laugh. I, I, I think to this day, I think the windows are the same. I agree. Wendy, did you want to add anything? Well, I, I would just say, you know, preparedness, emergency preparedness is not always a, a coup or a changing of a regime. It can be a fire. Uh, I can remember serving in Africa at a post uh, in Eritrea, and we had a major fire in one of our facilities. We had a small compound. And it's, it's one, how you respond to it. How do you, you need to do the preliminary work because we knew that the local fire department wasn't going to be able to get their fire truck onto our compound, right? So we, so we as a community um, kind of had preparations and knew how to respond. It, it can be an earthquake. It can be a hurricane. You know, lots of uh, what we call natural disasters that create those emergencies. Or, or, or even, again, another example, we had a, a key member of our foreign service community at one of my posts passed away unexpectedly. And, you know, there's dealing with the family, there's dealing with Washington and making arrangements, um, you know, all those things that you don't want to do the first time. And, and Julie brought it up, you know, you want to build those relationships and have that understanding of what everybody's role and responsibility is before the incident occurs. Uh, and, you know, Patty got that back in the 60s and 70s. And it, it really does attest to her, her, her being a little bit ahead of the times, I think, in many ways, um, that we now do a lot of our emergency planning the way she was looking at it. Excellent. I absolutely agree. She was she was not only a trailblazer, but she was forward thinking. You know, she she was ahead of her time. I think. Um, another question. I'm actually going to uh, include. Uh, I'd like to include Ambassador Smith in this as well. You know, making it maybe expanding it to diplomats broader, um, but. Uh, the question is, what qualities uh, did Patty demonstrate as a special agent nearly 50 years ago are qualities that are important to being a DS agent uh, today? And I would also expand that to being a diplomat today. Um, Ambassador Smith, maybe you want to, would you mind starting off? And what are some qualities that you see in Patty that, that you would see in a successful diplomat today? Well, thank you, Kitty. Thank you for this opportunity. And, and I, this has been, by the way, a, a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate everything that my colleagues have said. But I think if I were to identify a couple of things that stand out when I'm looking at Patty's life, one is her resiliency in the face of, of enormous challenges that she faced. I think we ask a lot of our diplomats abroad. Uh, today is no exception in that regard with dealing with the pandemic and where we have every country in the world that is in different circumstances and faces different challenges. We ask a lot of our folks in this environment. Uh, they need to be resilient. They need to be adaptable. They need to be agile. And Patty embodied all of those qualities really throughout her career. Um, but I, I really want to echo what my colleague said. Is it, what makes Patty stand out, I think, is the, the degree to which she was thinking ahead, that she was thinking about training for others, about resources for others, about helping others learn from her experience. 
uh, and making the State Department a better place, both from the standpoint of, of our security preparedness, but also of our diversity and inclusion. She, she really was a pioneer. Thank you, Wendy or Julie, did you wanna add anything? Um, I will say this, you know, Patty, I think came from uh, the standpoint of looking at things of, let's not focus on the differences, but let's focus on the commonalities. Um, because when you're a first, it's very easy to stand out, right? And I think she, she spent a lot of effort to make sure that people looked at her the same. And I think that's a quality that still happens today. I mean, yeah, in the future, someday, maybe we, we will be able to move beyond that. But I've been successful in taking that kind of idea and, and building a community um, where we are similar and uh, sharing those experiences. And, and for success in a security profession, you know, our job is to hear what the mission is and then tell you how best to do it safely and securely. And I think uh, the DS community, both women and men, we accept that. That's in our DNA now, and, and that's where uh, we need to stay. Absolutely, thank you. So I think we'll, we'll do uh, one more question, um, and this uh, can be for all three of you. It's a bit more of kind of a broader reflective question. You know, as we've all been inspired by Patty's legacy, um, the question is, what do you wish you knew when you started <laughs> your career that you know now? Um, what, you know, as you, when you, when you were a baby diplomat, <laughs> when you were a baby agent, what do you, what would, what would you tell perhaps somebody starting now um, to help them later in their careers? And that's for all three of you. Yeah, I'll start if I may, because Patty retired in September of 1994, and I actually started in September of 1994. And I wish I had had the opportunity when I joined to kind of sit down and have like that, that brown bag lunch with that pioneer and be able to talk to her. I was fortunate much later on in my career uh, when we were celebrating the DS Centennial to meet Patty and to talk to her and to thank her, right? And she still was as graceful and resilient, you know, 30 years later, um, or I can't even do the math, but uh, you know, you wish that you could spend more time with people like that when, when you're new into a job, because you really want to be that sponge to absorb all the lessons that they have learned um, and, and the, and the things that they wish they could have done that maybe we could do today. And I'll stop there. Um, I, I jump in here as well. Um, when I first started out, I think perhaps I had a little bit of naivete, which maybe helped me uh, enjoy myself a little bit more because I had um, some very limited exposure to the State Department. And so every day was a new challenge and a new learning experience, and I loved it. But I would also say, too, that throughout my career, I have been uh, very fortunate in that I have had a lot of great mentors and then uh, also have had some great sponsors across the board from all disciplines within the Department of State. And they have been very, very valuable to me as resources as I've carried on um, throughout the last, particularly I would say seven to 10 years as I became um, taking on more leadership and more managerial type roles. And it's been very helpful to have the, that resource, that informal resource to bounce ideas off of. And so to my younger self, as I, as, as I would, uh, would, if I were restarting my career, starting over again, I would advise anyone who is perhaps new to the Foreign Service uh, and to this, into the State Department writ large, regardless if you are serving overseas or domestically, find that core group of advisors, friends, of um, confidants that you have that can help you with your career, that can help you navigate some sticky situations that um, you may not see often, but when you do, they can consume an awful lot of your time. We are a community. We build strong relationships. That's a foundation of diplomacy. So use that also to help yourself personally and professionally. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. This isn't about like, you know, climbing that ladder as quickly as possible. It's more about knowing that you have a core, a solid core group of people to rely on when you 
need some good old fashioned advice, guidance and, 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 and um, career development. Katie, since you invited me, let me just add, I, I want to echo what Wendy and Julie just said. I, I think it's important to learn from these heroes of the past and to see them as role models and as, as pioneers, if you will, in so many ways. But, but I think Julie is absolutely right. We all need, and we don't recognize it necessarily the beginning of our careers, to build a network of people we trust and can rely on and who can give us advice and guidance and, and steer us even when we're going off track. Uh, in the course of our careers. That's very important, I think, to us as a, as a service and, and, and as, an, as an agency, so. Absolutely, well, thank you everybody. That was a great Q&A session and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So we'll, we'll, we'll turn it back to Ambassador Smith to wrap it up. Thank you very much, Katie. And, and thank you to both uh, Wendy and Julie uh, for their contributions. I, I found this to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I really, uh, I think it illustrates both uh, the importance of people who are pathfinders, who are pathbreakers for us as an institution. Um, it also underscores the importance of understanding and recognizing our past. We do have some remarkable people who have served in the Department of State and have served the American people. And Patty Morton is, is one of the uh, best examples I can think of to celebrate uh, in this day and age. So uh, thank you to everyone who participated in the program, but also to those who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this program possible. I wanna thank all of you who have joined us today. Uh, and I would put in a plug, if you wanna know more about Heroes of US Diplomacy, please consult state.gov slash Heroes of US Diplomacy, uh, or follow the hang hashtag Heroes of US Diplomacy. Thank you all for being with us today.